until the pandemic came and hit us, I think a lot of people were not quite so aware as to how much our lives are impacted by global events that might start anywhere. This is a real crisis. I mean, it's been clear that this was likely to spread in the U.S. We need to be thinking much more ambitiously. Climate finance is a very big issue. We, the Center for Global Development, we're a group that try and see how we can make the international system that supports global development work more effectively. CGD came about because it was time to focus not only on what developing countries should do, but much more on what the rich world should do. How do we finance infrastructure in the poorest parts of the world? How do we increase productivity in agriculture? What kind of policy brings out the best outcomes? Some of our previous work has helped to come up with a kind of innovative financing mechanism that was used to help launch pneumococcal vaccines. We really have researchers and experts here at CGD who come at these issues from multiple vantage points and I think that's just what helps make our research more rigorous, more rich and actually more connected to the realities that decision makers are grappling with. We've been looking to CGD for all of your research and analysis uh, to guide us. So CGD is nonpartisan. Because of that, over the years, that credibility has given us significant convening power. Our government highly values the work. What CGD is about is you can ask those difficult questions that people refuse to ask and actually find solutions. We're thinking about how climate change will impact migration patterns, how that will in turn have impacts on people's health. It's challenging to be able to align budget with ambitious programmatic goals, but it can be done. Every single time that we're able to get it right, it means you know, we're reducing significant poverty. If you can help to make things a little bit better, that's a good way to spend your time. Welcome to the Center for Global Development. I'm Amanda Glassman, uh, a senior fellow and executive vice president. Um, and we are working on this panel today on ways that we can make the international response to pandemic threats a little bit better the next time. We're going to be focusing today on the effort to develop and purchase vaccines with a bit more emphasis on the second piece, purchase and access to vaccines for countries around the world. As we know, at the start of 2020, uh, there wasn't any kind of mechanism in place that could facilitate vaccine rollout, uh, despite the huge urgency and, and the lack of precedent for any kind of global threat like this uh, previously. And so in April 2020, the World Health Organization, Gavi, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation, UNICEF, uh, some of the multilateral development banks, launched COVAX, the vaccine pillar of the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator. And their goal was to accelerate development, production, and equitable global allocation of COVID-19 vaccines. They started out with a pretty audacious goal, 2 billion vaccine doses procured by the end of 2021. And it had two parts. One was a, a sort of facility to purchase for lower income countries, the so-called AMC 92 countries, that was mainly donor financed. And then a second part, which was a self-financing facility intended to create a mechanism for middle income <coughs> countries to buy in to um, the, this pooled purchase of, of vaccines. So uh, with that goal of procuring 2 billion doses, by the end of 20. Um, 20, well, let's say at the, at the end of 2021, they had procured um, about a billion doses. And by March 2022, they had shipped about 1.4 billion doses to 144 countries and territories. And indeed, overall, this is COVAX with also the efforts of countries themselves and other kinds of regional groupings, we've witnessed the fastest and largest scale vaccine rollout in response to an infectious disease threat in global history. And despite all of the difficulties around fundraising, in fact, COVAX met its funding targets. But the timing that it took to reach those funding targets really has a lot to do with what we're seeing now. 
But despite all of these achievements, there is still enormous vaccine inequity. Only 18% of the population in low-income countries is fully vaccinated against COVID-19 as of last month, uh, compared to about 75% in high-income countries, lower middle-income countries, where in fact the burden of this disease uh, has been heavier, is higher. It's at 56%. All told, it's a remarkable effort uh, but there's still these huge differences between countries. And so these difficulties and disappointments and also the timing of the money, the timing of the procurement and the timing of the delivery mattered for what happened with COVID-19 and the mortality and morbidity that we've been seeing. So the question is, is this model fit for purpose for an efficient and effective response the next time a pandemic threat hits or indeed ahead of a next variant? So uh, we're really lucky to have a great panel today. Um, we're not here to criticize what's been done. We also recognize that there have been some previous uh, assessments and evaluations of the COVAX effort that are available on uh, the COVAX and ACT A websites. But what we are here to do is take a look at some new research that's come out uh, from uh, the research group at the World Bank, represented here by uh, Dr. Tristan Reed. And he'll be talking about COVAX from the perspective of an economist as a mechanism design. How well did it work to deliver and what kind of design features might we think about uh, for it to do better? So let me start with you, uh, Tristan. You've just uh, published a really interesting paper on this topic. Uh, you also published a paper very early in the pandemic suggesting ways to get faster in terms of the deployment of vaccines. Tell us a little bit about what you learned. Sure. Um, so, you know, we started this research project with this this question, you know, that in, in 2021, um, there was this huge inequality in access to vaccines, right? So, so many countries wanted them, they had vulnerable populations, but they couldn't even secure supply. And, and there were many hypotheses as to why this was, you know, there were export restrictions, there were you know, access to patents, uh, and so forth, and a lot of things in the debate. Um, and we really wanted to sort of distinguish this. Um, uh, another hypothesis, of course, was that there was just a line. So the countries that ordered first, you know, re received deliveries first. So uh, with a co-author, um, Richir Agarwal, uh, at the IMF, we pulled together data on every vaccine procurement contract uh, between, between countries and, and vaccine manufacturers. And we looked at uh, the date that the contract was signed and also the date that the first, you know, vaccines were delivered. And what we found was very interesting. So we did find that uh, middle income and low income countries did receive vaccines later than high income countries, regardless of the time they ordered. So this is kind of consistent with the idea that export restrictions or things like that did, did uh, you know, uh, bi were biased against um, low income countries. But the other thing we found, though, was that the overwhelming majority, so about 75% um, in, our, in our best estimate, preferred estimate, uh, of, of the delay in deliveries between uh, middle and low-income countries, and, or low-income countries specifically, and high-income countries, was just due to the fact that low-income countries, and then COVAX also on their behalf, uh, ordered later than, than high-income countries. So, you know, in 2020, um, you know, the U.S., Europe were, were placing orders as, as early as May, June uh, with countries. Most uh, middle income countries were end, uh, making purchases at the end of, uh, you know, December uh, and then low income countries even even later. Um, and so I think what this suggests is that while, um, you know, th th there are issues uh, in terms of export restrictions, um, the, the market was relatively free and it, the vaccines did go to people who ordered them First, when supply is constrained, you know, there's a queue. And so, you know, what what we concluded from this is that if you want more vaccine equity, uh, in if you wanted more vaccine equity in this situation, what you needed was more orders on behalf of uh, low and middle income countries earlier on. And I think one, um, you know, way to get at that would have been to have, you know, more resources available to COVAX uh, early on. You know, they eventually donors contributed $10 billion dollars uh, to COVAX, but that didn't come until mid June, uh, twenty twenty one. Which you know, I, I sort of ad I won't take credit, but we advocated for that in the in the the first paper. Um, but you know, by December twenty twenty, they only had two two billion, and in in June, you know, they had three hundred million dollars. So they they weren't 
an agency moving on behalf of, of, of lower income countries wasn't able uh, to just secure a place in line. So I think that as much as we talk about patents and, and export restrictions, you know, there really is this question of, you know, you need funding in place, uh, you know, to place orders if you expect to have supply. And so I, I think um, that that, in my view, is the main the main explanation for the vaccine inequity that we saw. Yeah. I, I, I just want to underscore, and we'll, we'll come back to some of the other implications of your work and, and what you'd like to see for the next time as a researcher, not as an official uh, World Bank spokesman. But now let's go uh, to the Minister of Health of, and Social Protection of Colombia, who's uh, Dr. Fernando Ruiz Gomez. And he also, as I mentioned, was serving on um, the Act A uh, governance council. And so can you tell us a little bit about what you saw during the start of Act A? How fit for purpose was it for an upper middle income country like Colombia? What would you do differently next time? Uh, thank you, Amanda. Thank you for global development for this opportunity to to very, very important issue. And, in a very important in a perspective for the, the next pandemic at what 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 are the lessons lessons learned while I was uh, hearing Tristan about this, this point that he 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 plays in the discussion and a uh, low and middle income countries both both countries and uh, it's important to re remember in the beginning the beginning of the of the purchasing process procedure uh, some high, high very, a lot of high income countries both in, in a in a development step of the vaccines so yes. took they were able to Vote in a in a take decisions of risk, investing their money, uh, and buying population uh, that that they have. That they they don't buy the amount that they need. They vote several times. So some countries vote the needs for the country. So so the the space for the law countries were constrained because these two fights were very difficult for a low income country and a middle income country to buy taking risk risk of the a financial risk involving in the, that you don't know if they were effective and secure several countries like Colombia for example and other South America American countries and a law to enable the government to, to have the possibility to buy vaccines taking financial and this for, for example in Colombia the this law was approved in December so we we were negotiating from maybe but we just have the possibility to really negotiate and start the procurement in January. And we, we did a very, very fast process in months to have our first vaccines by the seventh, by the February that we're applying vaccines. So this, this is an issue. It's important for the future. The other is I know that it's very hard to see a, 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 a country could buy, but, but uh, COVAX was, uh, I will say, in the middle of the line to get vaccines for the middle and low income countries. So, so it made a big constraint for the for the possibility to buy. Another issue uh, in the in the middle of the process of purchasing by COVAX of uh, 
national limits uh, for the pro in the providers of the uses of vaccines that constrain the supply of vaccines for COVID. That was very hard to deal with that. And the, th and the last one was the, uh, the, 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 the the real capability of special low-income countries to manage vaccine and, and to have the pros and to apply vaccines. Because at the end, when COVID had enough to be, it, it was right, it's a problem where some countries that were unable really to manage found no vaccines. So this is, this is, a, these are like the four issues that are important in the process. At the end, uh, COVAX was able to, to get more than dollars uh, from the AMC countries and uh, was to, to, to supply more than 1,300 doses for the, the AMC countries. But for the future, I would think in the organizational point of view, I don't know, know if COVAX was, was uh, a, a very, a very organization to for this big big purpose an organizational point of view i think uh, maybe we should think in the future not, not just one covax but several mechanisms at the same time like for example the revolving fund of the PAHO maybe we should have to take a a, 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 a a place to buy and vaccines for the for the Western Hemisphere countries. So they, they had more, I would say more experience than COVAX. They, they have the procurement to, to provide regular vaccines. So for the future, maybe I would say that the, 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 the purpose for COVAX was very, very important, very good for the was too high, maybe too high for the capabilities that the same COAS had as as related for this purpose. Thank you, Minister. I think those are all uh, really good points. Uh, your audio was going a little bit in and out, so um, I hope you'll correct us if we've misunderstood anything that you've said later on. But um, you know, the key points I think that you were making was. First, that low middle income countries were bought, uh, high income countries were buying while vaccines were still under development, making those at risk purchases. And that was something that COVAX couldn't do at scale, given the financial constraints that they had and some of the regulatory issues as well. And that manufacturers had capacity constraints early. So the high income countries bought the space. Um, second, that many countries had to take, make budget arrangements. Um, to be able to do this kind of advanced vaccination purchasing. And that took time. We weren't ready to do that from the get-go. Third, that because of all of these things, COVAX was in the middle of the line for their deliveries. Um, and that sometimes manufacturers prioritize direct bilateral orders. And finally, you're highlighting the really important delivery issues that we're seeing um, playing out greatly uh, in low-income countries. And then finally, you're posing the question of whether we should have a global mechanism or whether we should think about regional mechanisms as well to pool purchasing. So those are all really, really important points. Let's now go on to you, uh, Asusa at the Asian Development Bank. She's a special advisor to the president. We should disclose that she was a former visiting policy fellow at the Center for Global Development. Um, but you have been so immersed in the process of vaccine um, planning and procurement uh, with the member countries of the Asian Development Bank. Can you tell us a little bit about what that was like during 2020, 2021, and what kinds yeah, of lessons yeah. you take home? Of course, yeah, thank you very much, Amanda. Um, yeah, maybe I can sort of split my talk into two parts. The first being what ADB has done, and then secondly, uh, with my experience in Indonesia, where I was working for a while on vaccines and health systems strengthening there, I'd like to bring some perspective of Indonesia uh, to this panel. Um, so I think 
to say the backdrop of ADB pre-vaccines was when COVID was first spreading. Um, and we recognized that ADB had to do something in terms of budget support. And this was back in April, actually, in 2020. Uh, just like one or two months in, ADB decided, okay, we have to put budget support in for countries. And it's only after six months after that, that we started thinking, okay, what's next? What, and, and vaccines seemed the most um, prominent issue at the time. And, and despite having very few resources and experts uh, that, that know about vaccines, and, and even our health staff are very few, I think ADB decided we, we can't just let one or two or three mechanisms just do the work globally. Uh, and, and so we felt we need to do our part. And, and so we came in with a, a, a Asia Pacific Vaccine Access Facility, what's called ATVAX, in December 2021. And this was a $9 billion resource. Um, as of the end of June this year, we've committed about half of that to 16 countries. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on what ATVAX is, firstly, uh, it's split into two parts. The first is about procurement, exactly what we've been talking about, buying up the vaccines. The secondly, there's a recognition that we can't just buy vaccines and, and so be it. There needs to be some implementation and support for the distribution and the logistics side of things. And this includes things like training uh, health human resources and workers to, to administer the vaccines, ensuring that uh, the environmental effects of, of waste management are handled and so on. And uh, for countries to procure under ATVAX, essentially we put in three eligibility criteria, what is called eligibility criteria, and, and they had to fulfill one of the three. Uh, the first is vaccine selected for procurement through COVAX. So we should say first and foremost, we had great respect for COVAX to, to, to put that as our, our criteria. The second was uh, have received P, uh, WHO PQ pre-qualification or emergency use, list, uh, emergency use listing. And the third was that the vaccine has received authorization by a stringent regulatory authority. And this, to a certain extent, one of these three eligibility criteria fulfilled for us what we, let's say, would, would be a safety and efficacy uh, criteria. Um, now, in the case of Indonesia, uh, we've talked about timing and definitely timing was one of the issues so we can imagine in 2020 everyone the, the world is scrambling to try and get the vaccines uh, most high-income countries have already gone bilateral uh, indonesia is not the poorest in the poorest income categories and, and can certainly go through the bilateral resources um, and this is exactly what they started doing but this is as soon as it's june july august of 2021 uh, so by the time COVAX actually came into play, which was, you know, it was essentially nine months later, um, Indonesia couldn't sit back and not do anything. They had to have the plan A. Plan A was bilateral deals funded, supported by MDBs like ADB that could provide the resources financially for them and to a certain ex extent technical assistance as well in implementing. Um, and supporting with consultants and so on. Um, and so that was really Indonesia's perspective. They couldn't sit and do nothing for that long. Um, and secondly, we, Indonesia was always told it's up to 20% of the population. So, so the volume was never going to be enough, right? Um, if you look at the AMC component particularly. Um, and so they said, well, we've been told about herd immunity, um, <laughs> how we're going to reach 80% or how much percent we need to get. We need 60% more. Um, and so there was no choice but to go bilateral. Um, then by the time deals were already struck, this was quarter four, 2020, President Jokowi of Indonesia was vaccinated live on TV in January, 2021. COVAX comes in March, 2021. So you can imagine the timing, but it's not synced at all. Um, and there was a tipping point. And I think it's fair to say that that tipping point of high demand, low supply to low demand, high supply happen very, very quickly. Uh, and I think everyone maybe underestimated the flexibility and the pace of pharmaceutical companies uh, being able to innovate so fast and produce so quickly. Um, this, As of this year, March 2022, Indonesia has said, please, no more donations. Uh, we don't want any more bilateral donations or otherwise, or even from COVAX. We, we have enough and, and uh, doses are expiring. 
Um, maybe just a, a little word here, right, if I can have a bit more time um, to explain a little bit about Indonesia's history as well. Um, in 2014, 2015, 16, they've had a historical experience of H5N1, avian flu, where two years after it emerged, foreign companies were using virus samples from the WHO's public, publicly available global influenza surveillance network to develop flu vaccines. And this was without the knowledge or consent of many developing countries, of which Indonesia was one. So this is a stage upon which COVID came. And there is some suspicion and some wariness, let's say, of entirely relying on global mechanisms that are not entirely within their control. And to that extent, Indonesia is extremely um, uh, emphasizing uh, and actively promoting self-reliance and self-reliance um, to produce its own vaccines because it's completely capable to do that. And they want to manufacture their own and we're taking part in clinical trials early on um, in order to be able to do that uh, with pharmaceutical companies around the world. So I think this is, it's important to recognize the history of, of uh, infectious diseases in countries like Indonesia and to realize that they have the resources to a certain extent to go out and do their own thing. Um, supported by MDBs like ours. Okay, thanks, Aziz. I think the, the example that you've given of Indonesia really um, describes the motivation, um, as did the comments by the minister on when it is that countries went bilateral, why they went bilateral. But at the same time, in some ways, these bilateral contracts competed with what COVAX was trying to buy, although the timing was a little different. But maybe I'll go to you, Javier, to answer one of the questions that we posed as part of this discussion. We asked, um, you know, we see these bilateral deals, we see them happening alongside the COVAX effort. What what should we expect for the next time? Should we have a COVAX-like mechanism as the primary channel? for procurement and deployment of emergency health products. We've also talked about the importance of buying early before EUL, okay? So how feasible is that as individual countries, um, you know, to think about doing that bilaterally or not? But go over to you, Javier. Obviously, it will depend on the pathogen, but. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, I think the first point to make is um, the world wasn't prepared and the the architecture was not fit for purpose. Therefore, COVAX was actually based on existing organizations uh, trying to you know, respond quickly to uh, a pandemic the world was not prepared for. So we now have the time to rethink the best way to have the governance arrangements, the best way to have accountability, the best way to have both a global mechanism, but also as as Minister Ruiz said, you know, regional platforms. And we clearly see how countries want to have ownership, want to have self-reliance. It's clear that um, there's no way, um, you know, countries will fully rely and depend on a mechanism they don't have a say on, a mechanism they have some, you know, mistrust in, a mechanism that, um, you know, is competing with high-income countries. So I think the role of the regional entities, platforms, is essential here. And, and we see how um, Asia, we have you know, just, not just the development bank, but we have conversations about you know, what this regional manufacturing could look like. We see how in, in the Americas, ProSur, but also the, 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 the revolving fund are talking about you know, how a regional approach would look like. And I think that's in Africa, of course, clearly there's a very big push towards uh, our regional approaches with the African Union, the African Medicines Agency, you know, the Africa Center for Global uh, Centers for Disease Control. So I think the trend is there. The trend of, of, of regional approaches is there. I think it's a welcome trend. But I think I would caution um, the, the, the future of regional and national solutions because it will be important to think about sustainability here. It will be important to think about due diligence here. It will be important to think about, you know, the market, the, vac the vaccines market in the future, how sustainable that is, what's the price that countries could pay and how efficient these, you know, regional approaches could be. And if countries are able to pay, one, at risk, as you said, and two, paying a premium to maintain, you know, a, a resilient 
uh, more self-reliant um, system. So I guess my, my overall point is we have time to think about this. Financing, and as you said, you know, um, effective demand and having the money to procure at risk is important. Mr. Reese talked about it's not just the money. Legal arrangements are important. Uh, countries were not able to go ahead even with the money. They had to pass laws. So it's the time to prepare. Uh, it's the time to prepare not just globally, regionally, but also importantly, it's the time to do the homework. It's time to do the analysis, to look at the market, market forces, look at sustainable solutions, look at how this will be, actually be done in times of peace. Because now we clearly see how COVID is not the issue anymore. So sustaining this kind of investment, sustaining these assets, sustaining this level of effort is not a given. Uh, back to you, Amata. Thank you. Uh, very well put. Uh, although COVID is still an issue. It's still an issue. Let's face it. It's just that people are bored of it, but it's still unfortunately an issue. Um, I want to go back to you, Tristan, on something um, that we've been talking about and, and that your first paper that was related to this uh, discussed. Um, the, the idea of at-risk purchasing requires visibility and expertise into the vaccine pipeline. And I think one question is, that expertise is not anywhere in the world, right? Not every country is able to understand the pipeline and make those kinds of decisions. Um, and of course, there's the interesting example of the US's Operation Warp Speed, but also the advanced purchase agreements that the UK did. But you know, the UK didn't procure from a portfolio. They really selected a winner and they invested there. It's different from Operation Warp Speed. But can you talk a little bit about that? what you have to consider when we're thinking about at-risk procurement, how well it worked this time, what can we do next time? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I want to make a high-level point that, you know, first, so one thing I think people didn't appreciate enough was the, the value of purchasing in advance and getting a place in line. Um, you know, there were some estimates by, by Rachel Glenister and Michael Kramer and their team in 2020 that said, um, you know, just looking at the economic benefits of, of you know, for the economy, you know, middle-income countries should have procured about six or secured capacity for six different candidates. Um, that number for low-income countries was about one to two candidates. The, the reason for that is that, you know, if you have a bigger economy, there's more you lose. So the value, I mean, we, you know, you can you can value the benefits in different ways, but but you know, they they showed there that that people should have secured a place in line. Um, and I, but I think a lot of people were afraid of that. As you know, as the minister mentioned, there were there were laws that prohibited this. You know, I spoke to one person in a health ministry that said, you know, I, I would have been arrested for corruption if I had bought a vaccine that didn't work <laughs> in advance. And so, and and I think also people weren't aware that, you know, under advanced purchase agreements, you know, you don't have to pay the full cost. So you you agree to say I'll pay a dollar a dose now, but then I'll procure at you know, ten dollars a dose in, in the future. So it, it sounds like there's a lot of money at risk when when maybe there was a bit less. Um, so so that that is just something I think everybody needed to appreciate. Um, and I'll say finally before I answer your question is that Covax actually did make an at risk purchase. They they through Gavi with the little money they had they um, they made an investment in the AstraZeneca vaccine to pr pr produce it in in um, in India. And and you know that contract, uh, you know, unfortunately, AstraZeneca had problems and India also placed export restrictions, um, so they weren't able to deliver. But I think what that emphasizes is that the value of having a, a diverse portfolio. Um, so if you, you know, you had a, if they had also purchased, um, you know, other ones, maybe they would have been able to deliver faster. Um, so, so the question is, how do you do that? Um, and I think you're right that um, you do need expertise, you need, you need relationships with companies, you know, the, the, the UK government had a, a woman from, um, you know, venture capital uh, that they brought in to run the thing. Um, and so I think that sort of speaks to the value of having these regional or, or global um, entities that can pool demand for, for, for middle and, and low income countries. Um, at the same time, I'll say, you know, it's not, um, I, I don't think, I don't want to say that you know all countries don't have the capacity to do this. Low-income countries did purchase vaccines. Um, they did make bilateral 
agreements. Um, there's just a question of, of maybe, you know, pooling that expertise differently. Um, and I think that, you know, PAHO, uh, the African Union, um, those are those are great examples of, of initiatives that did that. Um, and, you know, I just, I, w I wish that there had been, um, you know, I think just a bit more openness uh, at the time to, to taking some of the risk uh, you know, um, that, that the high income countries, uh, did do. Um, and, and I think that, that would have led to or faster deliveries for, for low and middle income countries. Yeah. And I mean, one, one really interesting role that CEPI played, I mean, they did have a kind of diverse portfolio going, but it was really about the amounts of money they had to use at what period of time. And then, you know, that they had to make a choice. If I only have a little bit of money, I'm going to go with, Serum Institute that's been a reliable partner to Gavi for many years, sort of not anticipating uh, what that crunch would look like when the demand for vaccine really boomed. Um, but, you know, I also think it's great that you're mentioning the research by uh, Rachel Glenister and her colleagues, because, the, you know, it's so it was so valuable to purchase in advance and to be early because the, the pandemic could have gone a different route if we had been early to vaccinate. We don't know if that's true or not, but what if we had been able to vaccinate high risk groups everywhere, you know, really fast uh, right at the beginning? I mean, I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Tristan. Well, I, I, it would have saved money, we think, right? Well, uh, I, I think I think I'll just say I think that the global public good element in the COVID pandemic specifically is a little overplayed. Um, in the sense that, you know, this thing is really transmissible and it's not clear that, you know, any vaccine, it, no vaccination campaign is going to control it. Mm -hmm. And so this really was about, you know, getting, you know, the vaccines to vulnerable populations in each country. And there were substantial private benefits from that, right? You know, you you benefit, you protect your health health workers, elderly people. Um and, and so I think that, you know, the, the value of the global thing was was not so much, you know, we need, all need to work together because this is all going to benefit from us. It, it's more that, that you know, that there were these specific things where there are advantages to pooling demand, having a bit more bargaining power, having a bit more expertise. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, the, the, the Delta variant came so fast, it's, it's really unclear that you know, you would have been to st all the others as well, that you would have stopped that. And, and you know, new variants are emerging now when we have yeah. in places where we have, um, you know, a lot of coverage. So, but that may be different for another virus, right? That, that mm -hmm. is transmitted more slowly. So something like SARS, for example, or um, yeah, I think that's a, it's an important point. And I think uh, it's also important that policymakers understand that there are these different pathogens that have different characteristics and not everything is going to be as unstoppable as COVID-19 has been. Um, Minister, let me come back to you. Um, it, you know, I, um, Javier mentioned uh, that there's some interest in regional manufacturing around the world. Uh, and we know that Colombia has been one of the champions of that idea within Latin America. Of course, there's also Brazil and Cuba in the region and even Argentina that, that do manufacture vaccines. They chose to do their own in the case of uh, Brazil. Well, they would have the license from one of, uh, you'll, you'll remind me exactly what the arrangements were, but what did you think about those regional efforts while you were sitting there in Colombia? Were you thinking, I'll go in with Brazil on their domestic manufacturing? What, 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 how did you see that issue? I, I would say that model <clears throat> before uh, we Colombia did a very, very precise exercise with the Kramer model, and we, based on that, it, the point of from the point of view that a uh, program will enable us to 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 open the economy and to fight against poverty, because at the end, COVID was health issues. But poverty is an issue that it's very important for a middle So we took the decision to take a, a port, and this made Colombia a little bit different from other South American countries, for example. Countries rely, even COVAX, 
in one or two vaccines. We decide vaccines at the same time and to distribute our risk on our risk in these different uh, different providers. And that proved to be to be because we were able to have a steady supply for the first year that enabled us with some donations from the different countries to complete the program. And Colombia had also the Colombia has also that last year a 10% grow and we expect more than six for this for the 2022 but and the risk from the political point of view is very to, 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 to have this so we decided very to develop security agenda and I would I would say I will have a historical fact. The smallpox eradication in Colombia is done with vaccines produced in Colombia. We were able thirty years ago to eradicate smallpox vaccine that we did produce, and we stopped producing vaccines in a global market that will provide safest and, and this is not true right now this was the, this vaccine what cheap vaccines were very expensive vaccines and if you say new harm with the with the with the, the smallpox that we are facing right now, now with the the, the, the the monkey smallpox, the vaccines are even costly than the COVID vaccines. See, so on a country basis, in a regional basis, we should think about how a, a concentrate production in a region. This is this is an issue that that, is, that deals with health security and the work countries especially for largest countries like all for large population and several countries I think we're thinking the same way how to develop mechanisms uh, uh, to produce vaccine in a region South America and to have pre uh, previous agreements to, to consolidate the demand in a, in, a, in a new event or a new pandemic important for everyone. And I think mechanisms like Proso, even the multilateral uh, the banks had, had how to develop this, how to help the country to develop this. In, in the, the other side, we have in very, very small, small countries that even have they were unable to reach contracts, bilateral contracts, because they, the country was so small that it, that they, 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 there were no interest from most uh, companies to negotiate with them because they because so the, the regional mechanism should have a compensatory of countries in the in the regional. I, I think. Then the, in the regional basis, we need uh, capabilities for the su supply chains, for advance, uh, also for production of vaccines for the future. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Minister. I want to ask you, but also Azusa, go to you afterwards. One of the issues uh, that, that many people have commented on was the lack of information early about what COVAX was doing, what was the state of play on the contracts, whether commercial confidentiality clauses meant that, you know, you couldn't see prices people were paying in different places. Um, some people talked about maybe contract transparency was a good idea. And so we have one question, which is about what is the role of information transparency in support to vaccine access equity 
Um, and the, the, the person, Diane Paulina, suggests, you know, what about the UNICEF COVID-19 vaccine market dashboard, which was useful, um, you know, sort of what's going on in the market and who's doing what and how bilateral purchasers can use that information too. Um, I don't know uh, if one of you wants to comment on that issue, um, but you who are sitting on the governance council, what do you think about that? And I'm sure you heard of this from many people. I, I think I think we need we need to 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 develop in a multilateral basis some kind of uh, agreements on how to share because because we are and we will will be five years with the contracts that. Don't, don't do not enable us to talk about this this possibility how, how to share information between countries and how to share the, the information is it's is is a, is a very sensitive issue and as you the, the COVAX developed two different mechanisms to get vaccines that the at the end because they were designed for a, in a, a for a framework that didn't work at the end because of the information were so limited to 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 have at the end and to make possible to this this mechanism to work in the way that they designed that this is an issue that we should raise from the special multilateral health organization yeah. I mean, it's like if we want a market to work well, then we need to see the information on prices and volumes and sellers and buyers in the market. I think that's that's a very key point. And I mean, interestingly, Colombia has um, a policy where they publish contracts, all public procurement contracts, um, but unfortunately not able to do that with some of the vaccine contracts. I think it's, diff it's a very tough uh, political issue. But Azusa, do you have any thoughts on this issue of information transparency, market transparency um, in advising countries on their procurement? Yeah, absolutely. And, and for me, I think information and data or lack thereof was one of the most difficult issues that we grappled with when we were trying to do the support for the countries. Um, it, from our procurement perspective, you know, we need to make sure that things are good value. Uh, and in some senses, everything is good value in such an emergency, right? There, there is no cost benefit analysis to be had. It was just procure what we can, uh, what we deem to be safe and effective in a sense. But we needed better data to calibrate the supply and forecast, supply forecast information better. The governments were in a situation where they didn't know what data, what vaccines were coming when how much, what type, where they could uh, distribute to across the country, and in sometimes very large countries at that, where you'd really have to plan the logistics behind this. Um, and early on, many governments weren't even able to accept a lot of the mRNA vaccines because of the logistics issues. Um, and not only that, but some governments are very capable to do their own research to improve targeting and, and to improve the supply forecast as a result of better information. So, as Javier was saying earlier, now while we still have the time, this is the kind of thing that we need to work on as global institutions to increase transparency of data sharing and also to, tr to try and increase the trust among governments to share the data. Um, and this is something that ADB has been working on regionally, uh, especially in Southeast Asia, where uh, countries of the greater Mekong have been working together to actually share information on their disease outbreaks. Um, this doesn't happen overnight. This is something that takes years and years of trust building. Um, and there are, they are supported extremely well by global and regional mechanisms such as the ASEAN uh, vaccine self-reliance and uh, vaccine security declarations and so on. Uh, and this is something that ADB fully supports uh, to try and implement. Um, and I, but I think there are some countries that somewhat need to take the lead on this. Um, the countries that feel like they have the bigger capacity to do so uh, and the stronger regulatory mechanisms as well within their region. Um, and I think this comes back to 
you know, understanding better what countries are good at, not so good at, and how ADB and other MDBs can support that. Let me ask you, uh, Javier, you very diplomatically uh, spoke about the global health architecture. Um, but just taking advantage of the fact that we have two people from multilateral development banks on our panel and, and we have we don't have a representative of a global health organization uh, sitting on the on the panel. Um, that was not on purpose, by the way, dear viewer. Um, but, um, you know, how should the global health organizations interact with the multilateral development banks? You know, this was a really interesting experience. Um, in the response, because it really showed how they were in their own worlds. And then when they were forced to work together and understand each other, there was a lot to do. Um, some of it turned out satisfactorily. Other, others did not turn out so satisfactorily. And I'll, I'll come back to all of you for questions on that. But do you have any reflections on that, Javier? Yes, very much. I, I think um, it is important to think about well, the past, but also the future as a continuum. And it's an end-to-end -end ecosystem. And clearly we saw how uh, COVAX was really focusing on, on supply and the multilateral development banks were very much, in theory, interested in um, or funding how to procure on two, how to strengthen systems. But there was a very big disconnect between the two. And then when the first problem was supply everyone focused on supply but there wasn't a lot of, a lot of attention paid to you know communications on the ground to health, health healthcare workers on the ground to preparation on the ground and, and and Kovacs felt that it was actually not their mandate it wasn't a kind of like the first uh, you know problem that they were facing and on the other on the flip side you know when the multilateral development banks decided to focus on you know their response it wasn't about you know the, the 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 how to support manufacturing, how to support you know information exchange, how to support um, countries to procure. I guess all I'm saying is there needs to be a clear element of you know understanding that this is a continuum and. It cannot just be we focus on the first problem first, then we focus on the second problem, and each organization is responsible for a single problem. So these elements of you know uh, agreement between um, key organizations, we saw how you know WHO, the World Bank, the WTO did try to you know come together, but very late in the game. So at this point in time, it, it is important to have this high level um, council or high, high level. Uh, body that represents the different constituencies to have a, 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 a higher level um, platform where these conversations can take place, where coordination could be streamlined, where, you know, the continuum can actually be looked at and responsible organizations can be, you know, identified to address the different elements. Maybe I'll ask you, Tristan, specifically on the kind of financing in the early days of COVAX. Um, there, there really were um, differing viewpoints, let's say, between the bank and Gavi. And of course, again, this is not the World Bank's view. This is just, uh, not just, but this is Tristan as a researcher commenting. But, you know, if we had to think about, you know, if you mentioned how important it was to have the money early, and of course, the bank has a lot of money. Of course, it's tied up in country programs. How do you think about that issue of sort of how they interact with each other and what kinds of arrangements should be in place for next time? Yeah, so I want to say first that I think generally, uh, you know, kind of more broadly than than vaccine procurement, the, the multilateral bank system worked extremely rapidly and extremely, you know, quickly. This was a time when you had interest rates, you know, were increasing, the borrowing costs of, of developing countries were very high. And then, you know, you had the, the bank, the Asian Development Bank, um, making loans very quickly, helping countries, you know, not just do the health response, but, you know, maintain their budgets, maintain existing programs. And so I think that, you know, that actually worked very well, that part of the emergency response. Um, on the specific issue of vaccine procurement, um, there was a choice made uh, by both the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank to say, we will not finance procurement until, or, or acquisition of vaccines, where procurement wasn't used, um, uh, until uh, there is, um, you know, they're approved uh, by the, the WHO or a, another regulatory authority. And so what that meant is that 
the, the financing couldn't be used uh, by countries to say, you know, make advances, advanced purchases, um, secure capacity, uh, and so forth. Now, you know, there's a question though, in my mind of even had we done that, um, would countries have used the money for that purpose? Um, and I think, you know, the way the banks work is that, you know, they're individual countries that, that take the loans. And so, you know, we, as, as we talked, you know, many governments were afraid of, of, of actually making those at-risk purchases. So even if the, the finance was available, it, it may not have been used. Um, and I think the second point is that, you know, it, it the, the bank, the World Bank at least, you know, provides, um, I'll, I'll let, as was a talk for the Asian Development Bank, um, you know, we, we provide untied aid, right? There's, there's a pool of money in IDA that, you know, countries, you know, use for their own uh, purposes. And, you know, I'm not sure if, uh, you know, if, if we wanted to take that money and say, instead of, you know, using it on, you know, malaria or education or whatever you're doing, we're going to take it and give it to Gavi to buy vaccines. You know, I, I, I don't know if the shareholders would agree with that. Um, and so, and that's something that, uh, you know, really has to be decided at, at the board level. Um, you know, the, the bank does have a lot of capital, but, you know, countries also choose what to do with it. And so it's, um, I think it's, just because a you know an international organization says hey we need financing you have financing you know it's a there's a lot of diplomacy needed to to decide how to use that um, yeah. I mean I think the the issue probably however <laughs> I mean there are these global challenges right and um, the, we do have uh, the bank basically operates on the country model and this yeah. was the case of a global emergency it involved risk. And, um, you know, you can imagine a scenario where um, the MDBs put up the money for 20 percent coverage in low income countries or something from like a regional IDA window or something. You know, I think the question is, you know, should we be setting up those kinds of mechanisms now, recognizing that there are global emergencies that not every country is going to want to act at the same time and it would be inefficient to do it one by one, but where we really have to respond quickly in order to mitigate effects. But I don't know, Azusa, we're getting near the end. Do you have, maybe I'll ask uh, each of our panelists to very briefly say their top recommendation for um, what we do next time differently. So maybe I'll start with you, Azusa. Yeah, thanks. Um, maybe just one quick thought. From ADB side, I think there is a, a big emphasis on first putting more resources into health uh, experts, specialists, and so on. And I think that's something that's, um, COVID needed to happen for ADB to understand that in some senses. And so we're doubling our health portfolio uh, for the next, uh, 20, until 2030. And I think that's a major thing for ADB, which has traditionally been an infrastructure bank. Um, with that, I think our sort of main message is we do need better health system strengthening. So it's not just about vaccines moving forward, but it really is about supporting the manufacturing of vaccines as well as healthcare workers who work in the hospitals as ensuring that there's enough uh, good public financial management of the health sector etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and that we really do need to take a more holistic approach as, as we've been talking about the architecture of the health health system and beyond and um, so i think that's from adb's perspective okay thanks so much azusa uh, fernando last comment i will think uh, for the future, more in a regional basis. Uh, I think uh, regional health organizations work uh, 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 evaluating what happened in the region, strains, and what were the difficulties. What are the, the stories of the and what are the success and the failure stories uh, that we have? The, at the end, all system, health systems react and were able to buy, but but, uh, but to up to, to deliver vaccine and deliver services for the for, for the for the. And I will say that we should start thinking about. about uh, uh, for, for the multilateral banks that, that goes beyond loans for the countries. Maybe 
working together between and multilateral health organization, we could put a, a design mechanism that could, for example, link the revolving fund from with the possibility to have loans through the revolving fund. We had at all uh, countries in the, in the Western Hemisphere, in the Americas, both every year through the revolving fund. So maybe a financing to the revolving fund will will help some of the some countries. Now, uh, some countries have difficulties to get the money for vaccines because they spend a lot of money with COVID vaccines. These are working right now. How to help to finance a uh, countries use from the multilateral banks and the and the and the health organizations. Today about the um, the future and the, this is very important for the, and the and the centers and the think tanks is how to work information. How to how to improve the possibilities and how uh, how the uh, market uh, power could be in some way uh, uh, the information uh, for, for from the countries and from the different uh, vaccines. I, I think this is just economics. It's how to the economics market microeconomic theory to the to uh, how to develop really strategies to, to improve the the, the uh, for the for the next time excellent well thank you minister javier i'm giving you the last word we're at the end of our hour um maybe just to say that we will keep working on this issue um and we recognize that there are so many people who are not on this panel today and have things that are important to say and points to learn. Oh, I see Tristan, you have two a two second intervention before Javier says the last word. I just want to say that in our paper, we, we say that an, a standing credit line to something like PAHO is, is exactly the type of solution that, that will allow to be make advanced purchases is, is something very practical that that is you know possible. So thank you for exactly. that. So Mr. that that's a very very good idea that we can work on after this or in, or indeed to other um, pool procurement entities. Javier, last comments. Sure, thank you, man. That, I guess the importance of preparation, the importance of early financing, and not just financing but adequate adequate laws and and, and provisions. The importance of governance arrangements, uh, and that basically means how you get the interaction between global and regional in a way that will increase resilience, will increase re responsiveness, but also thinking about sustainability. I think sustainability is key and needs to be looked at properly. Thank you. Especially as we consider plans for regional manufacturing and otherwise. Okay, well, thanks so much to all of you, our panelists. We'll keep the conversation going and thanks to our viewers and until the next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.